in the unknown is risky, not in the cottage, but you know, we'll get over that. Now, I'm going to do a presentation. I think it's an hour long. I have one. Normally, I have one that's meant to be an hour long, but ended up being like an hour and ten because of my gibberish. So I shot the lunch of that hour. So in theory, this presentation is going to be about 50 minutes, but I think my degree will be an hour. And what happens, my presentation style is what I call semi-professional, and I know what I'm doing, but I don't look like I know what I'm doing. So this will just keep changing out every 30 seconds or something, and inevitably we'll catch up at a certain point. But for a while, I'll probably deviate. We'll have to revolve, re like reverse my presentation to talk to you on this. This is the first picture I did as a sort of adult, um, 15 years ago. Uh, I wanted something to do on a plane, I was going to Canada, I think, I was a smoker at the time, so I really needed something to do on a plane. And I went into a haberdashery shop, and I saw this skit based on the work of Alphonse Mugger, and I thought, oh, that'd be funny, imagine what people on the plane would think, man, my size, these are not kids, that will freak them out. I thought, I mean, by the end of COVID-19, you're the society going, I'm going to freak some people out on a plane. <laughs> and yeah, I still went ahead and bought it, but I'm glad it did, because I kind of fell in love with it. All this closure, when you do the, you need to sort your colours out to start off cross it, right? Because she's got this weird shadow up here that's meant to be the same colour as this accidental balayage did on the hair down there, when I got those two things wrong. But after doing it for so long, you just like, suddenly get things done, you know? So, uh, I framed it, gave it to my mum, who's up in her dining room, she thinks it's great. Um, but I kind of fell in love with cross at that point, and was sort of quite immediately hooked. How many of you do cross stitch? So I said it. You don't have to admit. <coughs> um, but the problem is, is, yeah, you know, I'm like a 30 year old man at the time, and I can't really find anything in the mainstream that's particularly interesting. I did a gauge up. I started doing a kiss by Grimm, 70,000 stitches, never finished that. There's a horrible mishmash of things not fitting together and being plugged to do. It's all completely. But then I discovered a piece of software called PC Stitch, and I was able to start making my own costumes, having based on graffiti artists or comic book things and stuff like that. Um, and then I set up an Etsy store in like 2008 and decided to start selling them. Didn't sell any of the cool superhero ones because I thought Marvel comics were not the way to do it, so I knocked that in my head. And I'm still just going, it's a bit annoying when you see people. There's plenty of people on Etsy that sell superhero costumes, they're so making progress. And there's one company called We Little Stitch, and they do loads of pixel people, and they've done brilliantly, and they've been around for like eight or nine years. And Hats off to them. I think that's something like 35,000 sales of next year. And I look at my store 10 years down the road and I'm like, oh, 150 sales or something. I was like, oh, no, that's not very good. But anyway, I started the blog at the same time as starting the store. I was like, I'm called this direct stitch store. I started doing a blog, talk about, uh, well, first I started talking about my life and interesting things like why I like cucumber sandwiches or the most efficient way to arrange socks on an arrow, which is obviously in pairs when you start because they're quicker when you sort them out. It's such life shattering posts. But then, fortunately, I've gotten on the idea of teaching other people's work instead, uh, things that I was interested in. And then I started looking at how to do like blogging semi professionally, having columns and schedule posts and all those sorts of things. And so that kind of how it went from there, and yeah, the website's been coming by 10 years now. I'll probably talk a little bit more about it as we go. Probably I've got notes today, I think I use them. Anyway. And then in 2011, I entered Kirsty's Handmade Britain, a TV show where I did this lovely Whitby Abbey at Sunset piece, 99 colours. It's a very, very neat mistress, which I thought it was a little bit of a new piece of it. We did an hour. Now, I found out recently, I moved to the Midlands recently, and bumped into a lady who's got a shop in Warwick who was also in the same competition as this, right? So I did this thing for the show, and we went up to the Yorkshire Country Fair, and it was like a flying journey. So Kirsty done her cushion that was involved, other people they filmed, and then they came to see me and film me doing it, and I was just like, and I remember putting it on the thing. I finished it at two o'clock in the morning of the show, you know, like a holiday in, and celebrated it into the frame. And it not, you know, not the best approach to time management. Um, but I, yeah, so I put it on the wall and then I was like, for a little while, because it's got like an hour and a half, so I don't just kick around and I was too nervous going to talk to her at all. So I was like, well, why didn't we start doing it? And that's not how it happens. Stuff like that. And then when they leave the story out of 100, they're like 30. <laughs> out of 100, I was just like, oh, that was really bad. Turns out, the competition, one of the journeys I do is variety of stitches. So I have no chance. I've probably got like all of the cross 
points and none of the other points. And in terms of your stuff with a person who made you different things, because the mind tells you she won't pay anything to burn, but obviously everyone was like, she had a little bit of health and stuff. So the good thing was is they thought I was wrong, and it was like, quite well me. <laughs> and then I got to do a Yule competition at Christmas in the same series where I scored better with like the third Yule log I'd ever made in my life, and it nearly career ruined at that point. But and, and then and then <laughs> So then you go on the telly and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, brilliant. People are going to, I'm going to be on all the tellies now. I'll shoot the camera since it's here, happening. Eight years later, <laughs> I finally get back on the telly again. And so I was on the telly last year. Uh, and I was on the radio. But the Strictly Down Dancing Dream still survives. Because look, he was on Strictly and she was on Strictly. So surely the rest of us, it's just a question of time until we're on there. So that's like major life goal. Happening. But yeah, I got through on the radio, that was quite good. And then following on from that, yeah, there was a program that asked young people who we'll make class Britain, where they showed people at various class works, lots of different things. So I was on that, that was quite good. Funny bit about that to be honest, was I had once gone and done a talk at the Royal School of Needwork, and me and the Royal School of Needwork were good friends, but I was able to say I was a busy lecturer at the Royal School of Needwork. Very fancy. And at one point, I thought, if you're into an exhibition, and I borrowed some stuff from the Royal School of Needlework, and I remember driving home, this was like two years ago, and going, I'm just this guy who started a blog, and now I've got like crosses of 250 years old in the back of my car. I was just like, what's going on? I don't really understand. But there we were, me looking all very intelligent and stuff, and that was quite fun. And I don't know when I'm going to be on the telly again next, but I'm not really holding my breath. I mean, the dream, the strictly dream, is real, and I feel like eventually they'll run out of all the other people that some guy with a vague blog and my four followers on YouTube will be worth putting on there in about 25 years' time. But it was good fun, it was nice to see. I don't know if they're going to do any more series of that. Uh, I'm what you call a man broiderer, so uh, we are men broiderers, and what happens is when a few of us get together, we have to stand majestically. It's like the thing, <laughs> can't really help it, it's a strange mechanism. So remember, man in purple shirt who looks like he would be the first person to die on the alien planet in Star Trek. And remember, man with five birds and jaunty hat because they'll be coming up later. But look at us, if you're trying to pull tough because the need works. <laughs> and that gender bias is quite a thing, really. I've done a bit of art stuff. I'm, I'm really lucky, actually, that I'm not an artist. So I get to I become a curator, you know, and showing people stuff. But every now and again, we love to do art things. When I did this exhibition called Pinnies and Heaven, it was up in Cardiff. And the only thing I'd come up with was this idea of pinny from heaven. And I was like, well, it has some crosses, blood splatters on it and stuff like that. And that was literally all the idea was. Then when I hung it up on the wall, we observed the placement of the, uh, the X and the blood and stuff like that. And it turned out actually I'd be making a pointed statement about homosexuality and uh, gender bias within that as well, to which I said, well, obviously, I mean, it was entirely the other. What I was going for there, down with the picture up, you know, that sort of stuff. So that was unfortunate. If people were saying that, and I was like, yeah, no, that was terribly what I meant by that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Mm. And all these other things. So I do try and avoid places where people expect me to make artistic statements. It's a lot there. And I can do that anyway, like, I don't know where we're talking like this, and I'm really jealous of those of the other and all that sort of stuff. But quite frankly, it's a bit of a pain. I don't know if I'll just keep it real. So I get to do curating. I did an exhibition of the knitting and stitching show in 2012 now. It really needs to get me back. But we had all kinds of cool things. We had our rock star quilts. This is a tapestry we do with like machine guns and drugs on it. There's doors with hanging Roy on them and all those sorts of things. So that was a good bit of fun. And I do just feel very fortunate that I've been around for long enough to see all kinds of new work and be able to kind of show it to people and stuff like that. I do workshops. Uh, this is the Urban Village Fate, which was this time last year. And again, it's happening in two weeks' time where we go and like do some crosses. This is Keith. He's a cross stitch, yeah. he, he does some really cool stuff, like one of the fresh prints of cross stitch. He does look in this picture though, as though it's one of those times when he caught ghosts on camera, and you don't know. But like, people never knew Keith was actually there, and he wanted to spread it as a disembodied spirit. Looking at cross stitch, you go, I used to be able to do that. Um, um, and then, yeah, last year as well, I got to do a project with the National Trust, which was really cool. And we did this thing called the Wing to Tree, where I invited people from around the world to cross stitch little baubles. And we put them onto a tree, and in the end, I got over 900 of them. And we had this tiny little high Christmas tree with them, and we had them everywhere. It was absolutely beautiful. It was at a place called Standard House, which is in East Sussex. It's like an art and craft property. And it just looked really groovy. And I had this like paper lantern on top of the tree, the big X, and it looked excellent. And we stuck it up, and three days later, there was a big storm, and my X got nailed, so we took that down. And now I've got three bags of pretty musty crossage left in my 
for long because what can you do in afterwards? So I've learned my hand is but rough it down with three wings at one time is not very nice. And then here yeah, I started a a magazine. I did this thing a couple of years ago where I bought all these planning books where you like design your future, plan your future, put down your juicy goals. And I had a day job for a really long time doing all this stuff. And I got one of these directed full time. I didn't really think about it, I just wrote it down and was like, huh, yeah, that's it, that will happen. And then six weeks later I got a letter of redundancy from my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no. But I've been waiting for so long for CrossFit to get with the program, you know, and I used to write a column for CrossFit to magazine and I would sit there and wait for them to respond to what I could see as being this amazing world of CrossFit out there, and it never really happened. But then I used Kickstarter as a crowdfunding platform to start a campaign to launch my own magazine. And I set a goal of six thousand pounds with the aim of that being enough to produce the first magazine. And I hit that goal in four days and went on to raise fourteen thousand pounds in total. And I was like, brilliant. And then I was like, oh no, I've got to make a magazine now. But I managed to do it and it's available here. And now we're up to issue seven. It's gone digital now because I've had I've done that thing where you've got to get Kickstarter money, you're like, I can do whatever I like. And three months later you're like, I haven't got any money left, I can't even print the thing. So now it's on digital, but there are five issues here, and each one's themed as well. We have different themes. But this, uh, the Heroes and Villains is the world's first ever double fronted sausage magazine cover. Mm -hmm. And issue four is the world's first sausage magazine cover ever with a toilet with some powder <coughs> and they use stuff like that. So each issue is themed, they'll get designers from around the world to respond to that theme, do cool designs, and they'll be interested in articles and we do all the stuff that I wish. It was done in the other magazine. So yeah, I'm having kind of fun doing that. I'm just working, this is the month where I have to produce an next issue, which comes in June, the theme is the munchies, and I'm like, hey, well, you can do food-based designs, and all we've got is it, you like donuts, pizzas, burgers, it's like the unhealthy, it's one smart going there. And the rest is just like junk food. I fear what we've become. But I'm really enjoying that. Anyway, started off with uh, my website, Mr. X Stitch, with uh, Mr. X Stitch, we don't do knitting, and we don't do clothes, but we kind of do everything in between. We do hand embroidery. And this is Anna Teresa Barbosa, who's from Peru. Uh, pencil drawing with embroidery on the side of it. Really lovely, isn't it? It's like, oof. And there's so many things that I've seen where I'm thinking, like, ah, they're amazing. There's something about the power in her work, of that kind of submissiveness and all those sorts of things. And you're like, don't do it. And then you go, wait, it's just a drawing. It's fine. And we do plush toys and soft sculptures. This is by a guy, a man broiler called Matt, who goes by the name of Channel Changes, and he does all kinds of like soft sculptures and stuff. He's in the film Kick Ass, with pretty violent films isn't it? And then I've got a plush toy, that is actually a fake one. I've got a plush toy version of the main character, who my daughter now loves, and for some reason calls him Gingerbread. I don't really know, but I don't need her to know the exact backstory of where that toy comes from, but very good. I think I've got more plush toys now than I have when I was a child. Very young child. Uh, but anyway, uh, and we do needle curtains. Do you know what I'm talking Stabby goodness. Don't do it in front of the telly, right? Because the little needles bar, because they hurt when you pull them out. Uh, Moxie did that, was the first person to do our Felter Skelter column, which is the monthly column that we have. This is what I managed to do somewhere down the line, is convince other people to write for me about things that they love. So we have all these different columns and stuff. And Felter Skelter is our longest running one, and it's been done by a girl called Zoe Williams as well now, who does needle curtains. And it's just amazing, and I really love like the hard and soft combination that you can get with a lot of textile art. We feature highbrow things. Tilika Schwartz is an artist in the Netherlands, and she has these really complex pieces that have all this kind of stuff going on, embroidery and words and phrases. Down here, we say, I will see what I can do with a smiley face. Which is a quote for an email from me. Oh, even that she put in there and stuff. And I remember. She was a part of that Friends 12 exhibition with these three big pieces, and I was like, are they for sale? And she went, if the tape asks, they're for sale. I went, I can't bother. I bought those. I love her work. It's just so complex and interesting. And then we also feature like that high end kind of embroidery stuff. We've got a, a column called Goldworks, which is written by a lady called Hattie McGill, who did some of Trade at Moore School in the New York, did the embroidery on like Doctor Strange's outfit, and does all this movie stuff, and keeps. Apologising that she can't write the column because she's doing another film in and I'm like, well, they're paying you and I'm not. So, but this apparently is called Man with Mushrooms Growing Out of His Head. So I've known you can prove it's a man with mushrooms going out of his head. I was going to, the older I get, the more I don't really understand what's going on anymore. So I was going to do a column called This Month, a thing I don't understand on medium art is this thing, but it'd be like an umbrella. Lace is one of my favourite craft forms. I've had a little go, it's quite time consuming. 
But Penny Eagles is a friend of mine, she's from Portland and she does quite, she just takes places and does like unexpected content with them and stuff like that. So it's quite a nice mix of stuff. And she's usually just complaining about how much her hands are. Because I used to just like localize throwing really, you just throw these little tangles like along a bobbin and then back again and stuff like that. But it's really cool to see, and I really love with lace as well, there's geographic specificness of it. You know, you get like certain types of lace from certain parts of the country and that sort of thing. It's really Really and then we have a column called Millinery Operations, which is done by a milliner called Kristen Silverman. For those who know these things, I don't know whether they're any hat or so like most of the time it's just a good gag. Because it, the lace column is called Invented in Time and Lace, which is what was funny. And millinery Operations, I thought was funny. And at the moment, I'm trying to convince the sewing machine company to let me do uh, have a column where we look at a small piece of the sewing machine, we explain what it does, and then we look at a creative project with it, and it's literally so it could be called a bit of a faff. <laughs> I know, I know, but they, like, they're nearly going for it, and I can't believe they didn't just please punch me in the face, but I think I know, but the boy is about to go. So, cross stitch, do a little cross stitchy angle thing. Um, before I was a dad, I used to have no time for this, now I have a little bit of time for it. But you know, cross stitch, a lot of the time, people do think it's very familiar and cute and all those sorts of things. And it kind of is, and there's very many mainstream reasons why that's the case and stuff. But the good thing is, on the internet, there's a lot of variety, so you just as likely to get somebody having a mind of only burning someone with a lace piece that arrives. And I always think that's kind of fine. And that's always been like the, the modus of the website, in a way, to take things seriously, but not too seriously, because otherwise, you know, art's really aloof, really serious, and so therefore none of us normal people can get into it. And it's the same with craft is almost like too, sometimes nice and normal or something, so you can't be edgy about it. So we just like sit on the middle and just like do this kind of stuff. And it just shows that it's all right. A lot of the things that we feature show that it's all right to be, you know, involved in this stuff. Uh, the hip hop fans in the audience of you will obviously recognize Two Bags and Biggie. Dave Gravy, another man, Roy, but this, I always, whenever I do presentations for like schools and stuff, I always put this in fairly early on because it's part of this game, so I mean, it kind of does the job quite nicely, but he's just owned on a, uh, and then stuck it on the side of shoes and stuff, so that's always quite good. I also like doing uh, embroidery skills talks where the average age of the audience is like the late 70s, and then I'm like, obviously, ladies, you would recognize two back in the year because you know you're men. They're like, what? Um, Brenna Hearn is a man broiler from San Francisco who does large scale pieces. To be honest, that's probably not too dissimilar to the actual size of the kind of piece that he makes. These big ones that are quite traditional looking and they explore his like sexuality and his stories and all those sorts of things. But he really, you get a lot of people who still take the very traditional style of sample and all those sorts of things and like play with it. Um, and sometimes, yeah, I mean, some of the text that he uses is a bit provocative and all those sorts of things. Diane Mayer, she's from Los Angeles. I visited her not that long ago. It's one thing to like take a picture and use software to turn it into a pattern. It's another thing to get the scale right so that it is in line with the picture, and then it's another thing to stitch it on top of the picture. So in many ways, this looks really simple, but it's really kind of complicated to do. And it's fascinating as well to see Diane's work for real. She's a gangster and she shows the back. She has it like glass front on the back so you can see the back of the work as well, which obviously makes people very nervous. I really like those, and it's a thing that will come up a few times where, you know, by manipulating and obscuring certain parts of an image, you focus on the other parts a little bit more and stuff. So she did a whole series when she was in Berlin. Alicia Ross is from New York, and she does these large scale, like negative space, quite erotic looking images. They're kind of electric with all like, the lines and uh, the threads and those sorts of things. And she actually does it on a machine, which is interesting. So it's kind of like, I don't, think, I don't know whether she feel like this, but no, no, I'm not going to care. But it's interesting because you think that using a sewing machine to do cross stitch is a bit quicker than doing it manually, and it sort of is, but I tell you, you know, with any kind of sewing machine thing, the minute you stop looking at it, the machine starts to smile, it works, works up into a big ball. So it probably still takes just as long to complete that piece it would be if you're doing it by hand. Uh, this by Lindy, Stitch White from the Netherlands. This is the only actual cross stitch in the whole thing, because I would argue, you can see up here, these are like crosses, and everything else is like extras, right? So all Lindy said is rotated their cross stitch counters by 45 degrees, and it's an entirely different form. Now I'm known as Mr. Exit, and I've actually trademarked work Exit, so I'm contemplating suing the world of cross stitch for all time in history, because they've been just like doing it all wrong and undermining my... 
And so yeah, if you want, there's a few times I can throw up. If you want to become quite well known in Royal VR, do that thing, and that one's one of them, right? So the 45 degree turn. Uh, plastic canvas. I said a little bit about that humbug helping, and there's plastic canvas is quite a good tool you can use for like trying to. So Lord Lillydown, purple shirt, gonna die when he lands on the planet. He made this plastic canvas. It's truck, obviously, it looks a bit like Optimus Prime, the Transformer. He transforms as well, so that's quite good. Um, and he's got a few patterns that he's done with the Transformers. He's also done tiny little video games, his little video game cartridges. He's done a 3D Pokemon thing where if you put the 3D glasses on it, like cocktail and stuff. He's done all kinds of clever stuff. His blog is excellent. He writes all the kind of thought provoking content which I have time for. Fortunately, I was here first, otherwise, he'd be like Mr. X and I'd still be working for a living doing something like Great. Uh, and then the other guy next to me, uh, with the sideburns and the jaunty hat, the hip hop fans among you will recognise him as Elliot P.K. from Berlin, who is one of Germany's most well known beatboxers for a while. Again, that age your old crowd, they're like, that's hilarious. You just always hear the silence as they wonder what on earth I'm talking about. Um, but he paints these big canvases and then stitches on the top of them, and sometimes it's like graffiti inspired images and those sorts of things. And he did a whole series of like, painted animal skulls and that kind of thing, quite big and quite nice and quite fresh. And then Keith, Keith, the man that wasn't there in the picture, the man who was a ghost except he's not, this is actually in issue two of my magazine and it's called Rat Map. And basically it's a map of New York and then he's color coded the different boroughs in New York and then written the names of the hip hop artists who came for those so that you can like plot your hip hop history against it. Or indeed, just take the map of New York and plot your favorite place from it. Because there's a whole, I think there's somebody else there, one who's got that kind of idea and stuff. So he's in issue two. He's also done a series of pieces to do with characters from the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, which is why now I'm trying to convince everybody that he's a Fresh Prince of Crossfit, but he doesn't mind being called that. So if you ever see him, tell him, oh, I think you're the Fresh Prince of Crossfit. And then you can watch him be like, you call me that. Uh, Joe Ray Manhattan, video game Crossfit, obviously pixelated and all those sorts of things. What better could be than a basketball team with a man kicking another man in the head? This always works quite well, and there's a load of overlap, and it's something I'm personally quite interested in, the overlap between like CrossFit and early video games like pixel art and all those sorts of things, because pixel art has emerged as an art like in its own, an art form in its own right, and it still made the tiny squares, and CrossFit is made the tiny squares, it's all the same kind of thing. Take, take a um, skateboard and CrossFit on the top of it, why don't you? And only my art has done many different things, this is probably the least rude thing I can show you. Yeah. No, he's done a whole series of like naked women where he's just crossed his like clothes back on them. So it's not really rude if anything is like unruly some pieces, but I don't tend to show that to some stage. So skateboard school, you shouldn't pretty much draw on anything. <laughs> uh, this Theo Humphrey goes by the name of Cracker Street. He's another man broider who's also a lecturer at uh, school in Target, I think, Particle Bristol. And he takes Vertico needlepoint covers and then hacks them. So he takes the cushion design and then just tweaks it slightly. So this is part of the Smoking Dog series. He's also got the Walls with Good Books series, the Cats in Big Sunglasses series, and a whole heap of other ones. And his interviews in issue one of X is Magazine in them here, where you can see some of the very, very dark things he's done. And when I was asking him about his work, to put it in there, there's one he's done for puppy being like, put down for these really gentle, I was like, oh, put it in there. All the things I've shown in my life, I was like, not the puppy, too much. Very clever though, very clever. Tom Katsumi is another guy. So, first issue of the magazine, the theme is revolution, and I'm like, it's going to be so different from any other cross magazine, and yet there's still two cat-based designs in there, so it seems like you can't get away from them. But Tom did this one, 16 images of uh, a cat jumping, and if you put them in, you make the template that we've got in there, and you put it on a record player, and you look through it, he's animated the cat jumping. It's amazing. He's such a clever guy. He's done like, I think there's three or four, he's got a design in the space issue, there's like this space calendar, and if you do it properly, it's going to take you 256 years to finish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I don't even know how he comes out of that stuff. He's done a cross piece of a lady called Henrietta Lacks, who was one of the first people to allow her DNA to be sequenced. The cross piece you've made has got her DNA in it. I don't even know how you do that. Anyway, so cross piece animation stuff is a thing that can be done. Tom done it quite simply. Colin Tate did it by doing the different frames of this stuff video game and then animating them together. I think there's a thing about sometimes you see a bit of embroidered animation. The World Cup had 
the BBC had machine embroidered titles for some of their bits, and that was quite groovy. But it's quite time consuming. So this <coughs> is probably the most intense cross stitch animation I can think of, and it was organised by a guy called Aubrey Longley Cook. And he invited 36 people to do panels. It's from Rue 4, the drag artist video Worth It Girl. And he took 36 panels and then invited the people to cross stitch them in whatever colour they like, and then he animated it all together. So it's like, yeah, pretty intense. I do sometimes feel like I could just put this on a loop and then you would be hypnotized and I could go through bags, like a sort of Batman villain or something, but I'm not going to do that, that'd be too much. But, so that's like cross stitch, there's so much going on in it. It segues me in a nice BBC Two star into the shame bug for my book or whatever. So, so I did a book, District Six Guys Cross Stitch Search Press Publishing Company, do loads of books inviting me to do it, and it was really it's quite a challenge because like, when I do designs, I usually use like, words and phrases to make up the fact I'm a bit insecure about my drawings and stuff. But I thought, so if I'm only going to do one book ever, then I'm going to make this the book that teaches you everything. So it teaches you like how to cross stitch, but then I have interviews with artists and there's different sections about why cross stitch is like more than a hobby and we talk about it as an art form and all those sorts of things. I've got a friend of mine who's a food photographer who did all the photography and she does the photography for the magazine and it's great because what I do Shuns around my house for a meeting, and I'll take slightly longer making a cup of coffee in the kitchen than I need to, because when I come back, like everything will just be a little bit tidy, because she sort of can't help it. I'll be like, oh, isn't that a really good pleasing? I hate that joke. Um, but it's also quite good because this one, there's a whole section called Stitching Outside the Hoop, where we look at stitching on other services like fences and all those sorts of things. And this is the shelf that you get from IKEA. I don't know if you can see that. It's like an optical illusion, and it's an L. And no, and no, and a K in there. And I, when I did this design, I'd done this whole Mondrian thing, you know, Mondrian was like these squares of different colours, and I got it planned out, took me ages to design it. And when I went to stitch on there, these gaps are really quite big, and so it didn't look very good. And in a Brian Panic, I came up with that look design, and it's quite big. And then there's a whole section on glow in the dark grid. Do you know about glow in the dark grid? She looks white, but it glows in the dark, and I love it. It's one of my favourite things. I stopped. I used to, when I used to do stitching, um, if I had a cut off piece of thread, sometimes rather than throw it on the floor, it would eat it because it was a bit cotton and I didn't, I didn't have a pin apparently in my life. It was the floor or in my bed, it was doing women. But then when I started doing glow in the dark thread, I thought I'd better stop eating it in case I gave myself like some kind of illness or something. But it looks like white thread and it glows in the dark, see? So this is an Empire State design for you. And when you turn the lights off, all the lights come on, all the stars come on, stuff like that. I did a whole series with DMC that came out a couple of years ago, which they called Glow in the Dark Detector, and I went, why did I think of that? What a great name. But we did the same thing, Eiffel Tower, Taj Mahal, loads of these ones with that same kind of idea, and I really like Glow in the Dark Detector, because it's like, it's white, but you can put hidden messages in things. So you can write, I love you in big drop colours, and like, not really, Glow in the Dark, and then you see it after that. It's the way you want to share some love with people. So, you get a few different, uh, Glow in the dark things. I'm aware that there's a couple of children in the audience now. There weren't there yet. So I'll spin through one of the two of these things quite quickly. But uh, this is better. Ooh, sort of thing. So that's the sort of thing you can do. Relax the welcome, by the way. One of my favourite all time names of a person ever, really. Relax the uh, That one's quite a clever idea. I'll bring it down. Uh, there's a book by Shirley Jackson called We Have Always Lived in a Castle. And that's what that was. But if only you get that sense of what's possible. This one's a good idea. Uh, ooh, oh, very deep, I think, but something. You could do that. Uh, and then, uh, oh, this one's good. Yeah, this is stitch fight again. You know how to do the cross stitch. Oh, see? So that'd be quite a good one. I do, like with my daughter, I'm now thinking like clowny scene, maybe something nice and innocent, and in dark, she says, oh, they you mother. <laughs> uh, Numero linguistic programming, maybe. Uh, this one's good, it's a little bit rude. Uh, but you know, when you have a long Christmas and you're just like that. Uh, I'll just leave that there, we'll walk on. There's a couple, there's, I'm going to give you fair warning when there's rude things. There's like one thing that's like rude, and there's quite a few things that imply rudeness, but you know, we're all adults, aren't we? Gregory Morel, let's make this one up. It's fine, it's fine. Oh, right. Frederic Morel, uh, depending on what mood I'm in, I either like this or hate this, but basically she actually goes, she finds old French needlework, she's French, 
I know friends who really worked at thrift stores and those sort of things and then actually gave them on to different services and subjects and stuff like that. And it's kind of like, it's gaudy and amazing at the same time. Uh, DM Chow, oh, I did another book. Oh, I forget that the first book I did. I did a book called Gush History, which is a gallery book of embroidery and needlework. And that was what formed the exhibition I did. And DM Chow was in there. And she always had these things. I never really understood how she did them. And then I got to exhibit some of them. So what she does is she has like a piece of gossamer or gauze or whatever, and then she stitches on those and then sticks it onto these cups, and they're teeny tiny, you know, like two, three inches thick and stuff like that. Really fine work. Then, when I did the exhibition at Ali Howie, I managed, and I still don't really understand how, with the help of the Lithuanian cultural attache, to vary from Lithuania in borders on car parts. And we got this car door that had flowers on it. And when you go to Ali Howie where the exhibition is, there's one room where all the exhibition big ears and the rest of like sales and stuff. And I had the first thing you see in there was this wall. So I just hung the car door on the wall and was just like, thank you very much. Now won this exhibition because you just see everybody who comes through the door and see this car door with stuff that sits on it. And oh she does, she does all kinds of like metal work and bits and pieces and drills on the top of them. And this piece was called Way of Roses and it was kind of like a female version of Pink My Ride. It was kind of that idea of like seeing what you could do. And sometimes at these shows you get like schools coming in and you get boys who are looking a bit bored and they see this stuff and be really excited and I'll be like, just try it, just try it at home, tell you that after the fact, it'll be fine. <laughs> and just like through your head. And then sometimes you get people who come up and go, it's very dirty, like, are you trying it? You'd be like, no, I don't, no, you don't put this on your car, you can say, this is art. You go, what? Go so like this, before we get into this, who's this guy over here? I know this picture. He's like, what is that? I can't read it. And I sort of hope there's a lamppost there, is what you mean. But uh, Harriet Hamill is a soft sculptor, so this is a soft zuki that she did, which is basically a full size soft version of a. I don't know why I'm explaining it. She also did a soft kebab shop that had soft kebabs with soft trays with soft salad in them and all of those sorts of things. And they're amazing. And then I think she's a bit mad. But what I'm starting to realise is that most soft sculptors are a bit mad. In a way, because you can kind of tell when you see the stuff that they do. So Holly, she's done a really nice job with like machine embroidery and actually taking kind of like cool with your sort of nostalgic senses with these sorts of things. And there's only a few of them, so like the, the level of detail and stuff. Like it's really clever and I really like that, you know, recreating all these hard items in Softness. But the reason that I say that people are mad is mainly because of Lucy Farrow, who goes by the name of Sodal Soul, who did an entire soft chemist job. <laughs> and every single thing in here is a soft sculpture version of things. And she's also done a soft corner shop, which I went to, where there was like a freezer with soft bags of peas in it. And she's done soft copies of Hello Magazine on the wall, soft cigarettes and everything. She's done a boudoir shop that has toys in it, children. We we'll just say that they're toys, and I think the rest of us can understand what's going on there. And she keeps doing these different things, and she gets like crowdfunding for it and stuff like that. And you see on her Instagram, she's like, today I stitched, I don't know, 350 oranges. <laughs> it's just like, mad. But it's amazing work, and I just really like it. Paddy Harley, changing the name slightly, he did a project called Project Passage, which looked at World War I facial reconstruction surgery. So in the First World War, if your face got a bit blown off and they had to put it back together, they didn't really know what they were doing. And he did a whole project that would like trace what had happened to people, where they came from, and kind of a sense of, you know, like the, the piece of work that was done to them and all those sorts of things. Like well, the cutting edge of surgery at the time. It's just an interesting narrative approach. Uh, Bethany Walker, I don't know if any of you do, do much concrete based applique work or stuff, really. Bethany Walker does that, she takes concrete and puts things in it. And, -da -da. and I was like, how do you do it? And she's like, why did I tell you that? My entire thing is like, how to make concrete work. So you know, a series with Bruce Singer where they made these concrete bowls and then had all these lovely kind of coloured, almost like leaves around the side of them that were arranged really nicely. I was like, I don't understand how you're doing that. She's like, good, that's all makes it valuable. So I don't understand. But yeah, get the concrete. <laughs> Once you do this really for your car, get the concrete, be pavement. That was something else. Mariama, I like it when people take needlework and they capture vignettes and bits of vernacular and all those sorts of things where you see bits of life. So she did a whole series that kind of explored the culture of her. Have I written down where she's from? I don't know. Oh, Japanese, yeah, Japanese lifestyle. People, I don't know, leaning against things. They're just these little snippets. They don't seem like worth capturing, but because they're done in embroidery and needlework, you kind of give them a bit more time. 
similarly, Susie Hickory, who spends a lot of time in Mumbai, she did a whole series of pieces that kind of honoured the people that she knew. So, for instance, this may very well have been like the lady whose husband ran the laundry, or, you know, just, there's a lot of people, I think, in that culture who are generally anonymous, because they just provide a service and nobody gets to know them. And what Susie did was honour them and make these like textile iconic pictures of them and then give them versions of them and they would be really touched by that because nobody had ever spent the time to do that. And that's what's great is when you can, you know, need work last forever. We're all making future aliens with every single thing that we make. And so it's like if you can capture someone or honor someone, so much the better. Um, Gillian's whole thing is like the English vernacular, you know, little bowling greens and all those sorts of things. You can sell them all over the world to people who want to know what England's like. I've got Brighton Pier because that's where my grandparents grew up. And it's just, you know, free machine embroidery, applique, really nice, like, illustrative style of work. And it, she's able to capture these moments. Well, I think that's fantastic. Jacqueline Royal, isn't it? Jacqueline Royal, great. Uh, there's a thread exhibition up there. So you can see her work for real, because it's up there. You go and see that. You get to see that as part of the whole thing. Go and have a look. It's really, there's some really great stuff up there. And her work's great. She takes pictures of graffiti in abandoned areas and then, like, recreates them using needlepoint. Like when you go and see her work, like they're really small, but I was thrilled to see those. She's done a couple of designs in the magazine as well, and she's from Saratoga, in the USA. Um, Yin Zhushen, then she would uh, ask people to describe cities to her and then recreate them in suitcases using things like rolled up belts and various other different pieces to create them. And I thought that was quite clever. It's, it's like that, again, people's. The things that they remember as being important are the things that she made. So it's not like she looks at pictures and creates these cities, she asks people to tell them about them. Sometimes people say, How do you close the case afterwards? I say, Did you ask me about the car earlier? And people ask me, so I did. This Kuanecki, she embroiders maps of areas and then invites people to stitch their local landmarks on them. So, uh, you know, if she was doing one around here, she'd invite you to come and stitch the places that you knew, the shops that you liked, the little shortcuts that you knew, you know, if you had any memories of that area. And I, think, I just think it's a fantastic project that anybody who works in a group that's locally noticed, you should all make your own textile map of the area. So it will last a long time, but it will also just tell the tales of the people who are there. She's doing it all over the place, it's great idea, that one. Uh, and then moving on, uh, a lot of people kind of use me to work to express their, or to process their emotions, you know. John Alexander Walters, she did a whole series of pieces that related to the fact that her husband was conscripted, not conscripted, but in the army, and while he was off, you know, fighting wars and stuff, she would stick pieces, quilts with guns on them, all these kind of things, exploring her fears about the weaponry and the kind of stuff that he was using and her agility with all. This is a red work pan gun. Red work is a form of embroidery that uses patterns, great depth and texture, and while she's kind of done some of that, if I'm honest, it's not like the greatest example of the red work style, but nonetheless, it ticks all the breaks and it's a handgun. So, yeah, I've actually got this, she gave this to me, and my wife might never put it up because it's a gun. Mm -hmm. uh, this is probably one of the most hardcore pieces in a way. I did the exhibition, when I did a project with the National Trust, I also did an exhibition there. Um, and some of the artists we chose used cross stitch to capture like new bits and pieces of oftentimes throwaway culture sorts of things because the impetus of, or rather the impact of doing the work in cross stitch is much greater. So this piece by Noel Mason is called Nothing Much Happened Today for Dylan and Eric. It took her five years to stitch. You know, I'll show you that first piece so you can get a sense of like the density of the stitches. But basically it's like this big piece and it's a bit of CCTV footage from the Conomine Massacre. So it's one thing you see that image, which is like scary enough in the first place, and then she's cross-stitched that, and you get like this double whammy of the amount of time that she's putting to create the thing. And a lot of the time you find that people will process their situations through that. There's another guy who did a picture of when the Challenger space shuttle exploded, because he was like 11 at the time, and it had quite a profound effect on him. And so he's cross-stitched that image, so you're like, you remember that image, and then you realise that someone spent so long making that image as well. But we try and like, I, don't know, I had a thing a while ago where I was going through a bit of a dark phase and I wanted to, I thought it would be good to try and cross stitch the five stages of grief, which are denial, anger, negotiation, depression, and acceptance. And by the time I finished anger, I felt better, so I didn't really cross stitch it. And I think that that's the thing that's great. Like, you see a lot of people who do a lot of angry work, but I don't think you can 
like contain that anger for such a long time when he's competing with like the soul soothing effects of creativity, you know, mindfulness and all those sorts of things. But you're going to have a fight having happy day fights. It's much easier, really, that way. And Emily Idol has done lots of quite dark work over the years, butchy shots and all kinds of stuff, but in a charming, sheen embroidered, long child style. So that's quite my line. Uh, this is a reminder that now we're heading into some greasy territory. Does that quite so? Because it's going to be there's this one piece coming up next, it's got a bunch of swear words on it, that's all. And then after that, we're playing plating. Um, but, did you ever drop an iron on your foot? That's all I'm going to say. And then I'll just move on, right? Loot tree, uh, there's so much stuff out there. I do a whole series called Not Safe to Work Saturdays. It's like, there's a thing with needlework where people think that needlework should be safe, you know, the mainstream says it's safe and cute and stuff like that, but subversive art has been around as long as art has been around. And even in the Bay of Tapestry, there are rude bits and pieces if you find them. So I show that stuff, I can kind of get away with it, but then also for some people it says it's all right, and that means that they'll have a go. If they'll have a go, they can't stay in the rude zone for too long. They're going to move on to stuff with more meaning eventually. Erin Riley, she does tapestry weavings of like selfies and all those kinds of things. She's a lot of her work is really, really personal, but it's combined with that fact that it's woven tapestry. It's a bit like the, up in the top room, there's a massive space capsule tapestry done by Kristin, can't pronounce the surname, and, you know, it's huge, and with Erin, her work is massive, but she'll do, like, selfies or weird images having markings and stuff. Pierre Fouché, she, <sighs> Pierre Fouché takes uh, Bobby Blake and creates it and reflects, you know, things like homosexual porn stars and various images because it reflects his sexuality and he's using that very traditional format to do it. Nothing too rude, but a couple of bits are kind of rude. There's Vicky Swig, Leah Emery, is an Australian artist, and her website is full of all kinds of retro adult entertainment, shall we call it, and we'll leave it there. And she's done a few pieces. This one's quite rude, but you kind of can't really tell what's going on. Hopefully, if you're in, uh, then I haven't got a clue what's going on. No idea what to live on. Um, but you know, it's just that whole contrast of, of using these kind of materials which people are always familiar with. You know, whether you use it for strong political messages or for like slightly rude things or whatever. I love, you know, like we talk about our like, 80 year old embroidery children. I like to put this on there just to do that and see what it is. I met Erica, she's a lovely lady, she's from the States. Does all kinds of work with like embroidery and beadwork and all those sorts of things. Well, as far as I can tell, she's just finished jogging and she was just tying his shoe up. I think that was what was happening in that piece. But it's always quite funny to have that piece and just watch people know. I know that there's nothing on that piece. But people get quite nervous about it. And then when you're a kid and you do that thing with nails and strings and stuff like that, and people say that there's something going on in there, I've got no idea what it is. So we just move on. Really. And then go to sleep, which is more likely what happens as far as I'm concerned when we're in the room territory. So we say away quite nice there. We've gone that was it, that was all the room stuff. Children, you can revert your game now, back to normal again, so it's fine. And uh, Louise Riley did some big stitch pieces on mattresses. Four eyes like pop eyes, so she did as she stitched through them. I really like that kind of scratchy sort of painterly style that she had and stuff like that. And similarly to Oetta, who used to write a column for me, she's got this like big, like almost full scale installation piece that someone came to see. So now we're nice and that. And that's all very good. I think, well, is everybody alright? I feel you're all comfortable and stuff. Mm. We're doing alright. I think we've only got about another 70, 80 slides to get. <laughs> No, we haven't. We're heading towards the end quite nicely. So I'm just going to finish up with like a random interpretation of people that I like now, just to prove what cool stuff is out there. There's a thing I say, some, some of that content we show, like people might not be at ease with that content, and what they'll do is they'll criticise the form. So, you know, some of the stuff is cross-stitch, and they'll go, oh, it's only cross-stitch. And by saying it's only cross-stitch, it gives them an out rather than going, I'm not at ease with what you are presenting to me. Charlotte Bailey, trained at the Royal School of Needlework, this is like, sublime gold work, you know, couching, the kind of work that you would see on your paper grants and all those sorts of things. And she did a whole series of pieces subverting chocolate bar logos and kind of exploring eating disorders and all those sorts of things. And the best thing about it is you can't fault that. Like that's embroidered excellence. So if you don't like what she's got to say, you have to come out and say I'm not comfortable with that. And I want to I want to kind of learn that stuff. So at some point I go, right, and really roll the seat up and really try and upset people and just have them go, you know, but with the most beautiful, like, lace you ever saw that told you where to go. 
something like that. I probably won't because it's going to look fun right now. But, but I love that, you know, you just, you just see excellence or you see techniques you can't understand. Robert Foreman has this technique of thread painting where what he does is he sticks the threads onto the surface. And it's not just that he does that, but then he creates like these multi-layered pieces. And I don't, I don't even understand how you do that in any medium anyway without Photoshop trickery. But he just layers these pieces on and then has all these images inside one another. He once got bursary to go to Mexico to visit a group of like a tribe of people who did the same technique on their coffins and they do kind of skillshare exercise and stuff. Beadwork. I'm quite a fan of beadwork. There's a thing on Facebook called Battle of the Beadsmiths where you see all these people from like Eastern Europe who've like literally blown my mind with the stuff that they can do with beads and it seems like it's kind of underrated. It's another one where it's like we can make nice jewelry out of it, but why can't you make some tricky beetles kind of guru thing that's covered in beads or whatever, you know? I think there's tons of effects in there. Is that part of the problem I do think is it's quite shiny, so that little bit of DNA allows us the same as the DNA of a jackal, just makes us want to go and scratch you with beads and have a look instead. Some work. Anybody wants to be an artist, be a sunwork artist because nobody has really taken sunwork very beyond, I don't know, Nottie's Gardens and Lumpy Lumpy things. Whereas Jacinta Stitch Delicious did a sort of framing heart tattoo. And she did that like nine years ago, and then I've got that in my house now. So, you know, pay me a ten, I'll pretend it doesn't even exist. She would be the first sunwork artist ever to do an eating thing. I feel like there's just so many of these things where. People haven't quite like grasped them. A lot of people are doing interesting things with the more traditional techniques, but there's still a few areas out there. Stephanie Kelly, this is just satin stitch. I mean, it's a bit of like a happy day right there. Just straight stitches, and yet somehow she creates the most amazing like houses and landscapes, and all just using that kind of single straight technique with a bit of kind of silk shading thrown in and all those sorts of things. Like, without a doubt, she's one of my favourite artists. Um, I know how she does it, and you know, I don't know how she does it. And it's amazing when you see that. Faye Ahmed, Azerbaijani weaver. So Azerbaijani people have a strong tradition of like rug making, and what he's taken is like futuristic thinking and applies it to the rug. So sometimes he's happening, you know, this is all, all a rug, it's not like a photoshoppery. So he's kind of taken it and created this rug with all these different shapes and glitches in them, and he's like broken graffiti into them, and some of them he like pulled in different directions to like 3D shapes and stuff like that. I wrote an article about him once for Fiber Art Now magazine and I was just like, he's he's like he's making tradition exciting. Sometimes tradition get wiped out by like the modern world and all bland and stuff. Whereas he's like, if we wanted to apply exciting thoughts to tradition, we could do all kinds of cool things. Jeremy Chase Sanders is synesthetic. So he turns the letters and numbers into colours in his mind. And what he did was a series of fabrics that had words woven into them that only he knew what they were. So he did all these kind of fabrics, some of them related to his sexuality. So he did phrases like queen and all of those sorts of things. And I remember once saying to him, how much would it be for some fabric that said Miss Stitch? And he was like, $1,500 a yard. And I went, that's crazy. Thank you very much. I'll come back to that one. And that happened to him back in the Very clever. This is a good one. Ooh, ow, don't try it at home when you try it. Don't try it. Uh, Elizabeth Bentley did a whole series called uh, A Woman's Work, which was looking at like, the textile industry and garment workers and all those sorts of things. And just stitching underneath one of the layers of her skin to kind of create that effect. I did a talk at the Handmade Fair, first year there was a Handmade Fair, and it's a similar sort of place, just like 300 people, and me and a friend of mine called Debbie Nietzsche were doing it, which is cool, and it is versus stitching. And we had these different rounds where she showed knitting and I showed stitching. And I we just done a cute round where I'd done the lady stitches like kittens on pockets and she'd done a baby in a yoga costume. And then immediately after that we got that hand on everybody and it was like, ooh, that thing. And Zoe Williams writes my needle felting column, and I visited these two pieces, of this and another piece, um, at that 2012 knitting and stitching show. And it, you know, it's all just layer upon layer of sad wool and then she applies bees and all those sorts of things. But I swear to God, people would like look behind the other side of the wall. <laughs> Just to see whether there was a rest of like a giant needle felted rhino behind them or something. Uh, this is uh, French knitting, which is controversial because it's like literally the only piece of knitting I've ever allowed in. Have you, some of you knitters, obviously, and I do love knitting because it's practical, it's very useful. But you've got Ravelry, which is like the best knitting resource you could ever want. And I thought about setting up one for stitching and calling it Bible I thought that sounds a bit aggressive. So I didn't. 
But you know, there's a place that I'd like to check as well that like do you know why you can't make knitting needles on the planes is because knitting and terrible isn't it? I went a long time before I used that joke, but now I'm happy with it. Uh, this one's good. These aren't real. Um, Deborah, they're really poignant. She just makes these big sculptures that kind of strips away and then embroiders various parts of their anatomy and all those sorts of things on them. And I just think they're really beautiful and they kind of like break your heart a little bit and you have to keep going, no, they're not real. This is like sculptures and stuff. But then the other thing I wonder is like, what does she do with them? Like a lot of these people, you make really big things. Like, what do you? Does she like just put a tabletop on that <laughs> and just have it in her lounge or something? Like, it's not fair. Um, Matthew Cox, he embroidered on X-rays, so there's a thing you could try if you wanted. Really, he just takes embroidery and you know doesn't know what is going on with the person who the X-ray really is of. So he just weaves a narrative, whether it's gods or comic book characters or superheroes or you know other scenes and all those sorts of things. So he's just quite clever layer of storytelling. Uh, Buttons is another area that's right for a bit of like improvement really. So Lisa Coating does all these kind of images where she, I mean she uses all kinds of different things, she scraps of lace, various other textiles and stuff, always with that kind of like, almost like scrapbooking -y kind of take apart your approach to it, but this time using buttons and all those sorts of things. So I'm sure there'll be a few of you who've got button patches, patches that you're not scared to talk about. This is a way to justify it using art. So that's why. I'm sure there are some people out there who just like run a craft shop to justify their addiction to like wool or whatever. <laughs> My mum <laughs> is heading in that therapy. Luke Haynes is a pretty good friend of mine. He's uh, in Los Angeles and he trained as an architect and then moved into doing quilting. More kind of art quilts and patchwork quilts, but big pieces and I really like his sort of illustrative style. And that reminds me that he owes me a quilt. We did a, a swap. And I was going through a phase where I actually did some cross stitching and I was cross stitch spam email titles. And he and I agreed we just swap people on another. And I did him one that said, Care about your manliness, which I just thought was a funny turn of phrase. And he still owes me a quilt, so I'm going to email him and remind him about that. Adriana Pace uses conductive thread, right? So she did a series of pieces where it was the first line of poetry. And if you put your finger near it, the electromagnetic field on your finger would close the circuit that was there and it would play the MP3 of the message. Oh, that's clever. There's loads of scope for that kind of interactivity sound spacing. Stuart Easton, who's got some pieces upstairs and been exploring that territory, he did a big quilt that had different panels he could touch and it would unlock sound. This piece by Ellis Developments is actually a scientific tool that's used to enable muscle to graft back onto bone. So if your muscles are stripped through bone, they use these and place on your bone and it provides a surface. To adhere to, it's made polyester sort of aesthetically pleasing. And I think with like, you've got an award for like being a beautiful science thing, which I really just didn't let down, so it's not an aesthetical way to tell you, but yeah, science, something in that, something. Uh, you can take a piece of fabric and creatively iron it and make it your own run. So we'll go ahead and do that then. That'll be fun. This is another one of those, right? I understand Benjamin Shine, he's just on his Instagram, he does this all the time, right? You're like, they take a piece of fabric and be like, this fat spot in stunning wardrobe or something or other. It's like, I can see how it's done. I don't understand how he does it. It's a little weird alchemy. But they're amazing. And yeah, I would, of all the people to go and have a look at, if you want to buy some instant, like, impress your friends, show them a bit of engine shine. This piece is by Marlo Zoika. Luckily, again, I've ended up with this in my royal collection of, in my loft. I don't know what else I'm pleased out. This piece sums up a lot of the embroidery kind of thing because it's like we've got lace, we've got guns, we've got machine embroidery and applique and nipples and a bit of neon thread and stuff. And it kind of shows how much is out there. And I'm always, for a long time, I was really like disheartened with the mainstream state of play, but now I realise that it's fine because thanks to social media, people are able to share ideas with one another. And eventually things will change. And if they don't, then there's people like me who. I like to think I'm like the Uber of Crossy's magazine. Do you know what I mean? Eventually people are going to come along and they're going to go, I'm not, I'm not happy with the way things are, I'm just going to disrupt things. And hopefully it will all change. Ben Venom makes girls using heavy metal t shirts. He's got an exhibition coming up in June in Birmingham. I'm well excited because I live near there, so we're going to go and get to meet him. And there's so many people that are just refreshing the ideas. And yeah, thanks to places like Instagram now, you can find them more easily and you can see that people are learning from one another and kind of getting out there and, ah, oh, here's a piece of I did. Sometimes people say embroidery isn't an art form, and I slap them on the back of the head, because you, you're stupid. 
Now, I've got a whole thing in the book about it, and also the pattern of lonely leaders in the industry. Um, but it's not about the medium, you know, embroidery is an art form because it's not the medium that's the issue, it's the self expression that's the issue. And, you know, people take time and they, regardless of how beautiful it looks, if they express themselves, if they make the thing and it's personal and it's unique, then that's art. I mean, it doesn't matter what it's made of, you know, the whole. This is art and this is craft. It's merely a socio-political discourse that's meant to elevate the state of Savannah and maintain in her for hundred thousand pounds to paint circles on wall for Christ's sake. Stick her poster on it. Sarah agreed. She did the embroidered door in the exhibition that we had right at the start, and then she's done various pieces. When I did that exhibition, we ended up having a Milton Keynes gallery, and she did this bathtub that had words of poetry stitched inside it. And people would be like, does the water run out of that bath? Is that you again? <laughs> Come on, it's too safe. But no, but uh, someone did ask me that, does the water run out of that really? Jimmy McBride lives on a spaceship and drops, like, makes quilts out of the things that pass him by as he flies through space. Or at least that's what he tells us, and I think that's reasonable. Because it's a way of going, the embroidery kind of covers everything. And so it is an art form, and it is all encompassing, and you can use it to make whatever you like. Whether it's the Farthest creatures of outer space, or the beauty of the human soul, as captured by Face of Alien with her stunning New York portrait. Just hand embroidery, 200 hours. There's a piece in my first book of her son, it took her 200 hours and 200 colours on it, and it's just a stunning portrait. It just feels to me like we've all got an opportunity to express ourselves through these forms, and hopefully I've just like overwhelmed you with ideas for like the past hour. So, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey. I've got, uh, I need a